Hello, Bishop Patrick. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, I'll hand over to you whenever you're ready. <laughs> thank you, Joe. And thank you, everyone. It's good to be with you by means of uh, Zoom. And thank you so much for giving so generously of your time tonight. The title of the talk is Knowing the Love of God. And the subtitle is Understanding Our Identity as God's Beloved Sons and Daughters. In Hans Christian Andersen's story, The Ugly Duckling, you might remember that a mother duck discovers that one of her newly hatched chicks in the nest is unusually large and very ugly. At first she wonders if she has somehow hatched a turkey egg, but the ugly chick can swim as well as any of her other chicks. So she comes to the conclusion that the poor thing is simply abnormal and disfigured. The other ducklings, however, cannot leave the ugly chick alone. They punish him mercilessly, pecking at him, teasing him, making life miserable. Finally, the ugly duckling decides it would be better for everyone if he left. And so he runs away. During the bitter cold of his first winter on his own, the poor duckling nearly freezes to death, but somehow he survives. In spite of his difficulties, he finds himself getting stronger as the year goes by. And he loves spreading his wings and taking flight into the sky, even though he's all alone. Then one day he sees overhead a flock of majestic birds, white as snow, graceful in their movements, with beautiful long necks and wide, elegant wings. Oh, what glorious and happy creatures, he thinks to himself. The ugly duckling longs to fly with them, but he's afraid they might kill him because he's so ugly. But then he decides that would be better than being pecked forever by the other birds or freezing to death in the winter. And so he takes flight, catches up not far behind them and follows them to a beautiful lake where they settle onto the water. As he lands, the ugly duckling looks into the water and sees the reflection there of a magnificent swan. Gradually, unable to believe it at first, the ugly duckling realizes that the reflection is his own. At last, he has discovered who he really is. Like this young swan, much of the confusion we experience in life comes from simply not understanding who we truly are, our true identity in the sight of God. Too many of us, for too long, go about our lives thinking that we are of little worth, when in reality, we are God's greatest work of art, made in his image and likeness, elegant and eternal creatures of infinite value, beloved sons and daughters of God with potential beyond imagination. Like the young swan, there can, however, be many critical voices which each of us has at times to contend with. Sometimes the critical voices of those around us are those whom we're trying our best to serve at home, at work, at church. And sometimes in spite of our best efforts, those negative voices, those criticisms do affect us. They lower our spirits. We can feel hurt and misunderstood. But so often, I think you would agree, the severest critic of all is not other people, but that voice within us, which fills our hearts and minds with self-doubt, which accuses us of being a fraud or a failure, which speaks to us of our fears and our personal struggles. That voice within, which reminds us perhaps of past failures, which depresses us with the thought that nothing much seems to be changing 
in our lives. The same sins, the same weaknesses and temptations. Bombarded at times by negative voices coming to us from outside and from within us, there is a real danger of our true identity and self-understanding being badly affected by all this. So we need the opportunity to be helped to discover and then regularly reminded the purpose of this talk, who we really are in the sight of God, namely God's beloved sons and daughters. This is important, crucial, because every one of us wants to be loved. Most psychologists agree that our greatest need is to love and be loved. The one English word love encompasses so much, however. There are three Greek words which bring out aspects of love. The first is eros, which suggests sensual desire. The second is filio, which is used for friendship or love of one's friends or relatives. This conveys a sense of loving someone because they are worthy of love. And then finally, there is agape, which is God's love and the focus for the talk tonight. Agape is God's supernatural, unconditional love for you and me, revealed most especially in the life, ministry, and teaching of Jesus, and revealed supremely through his death on the cross for us. The love expressed in agape is given because of the character of the person doing the loving, God, rather than because of the worthiness of the one being loved, you and I. Let me say that again. The love expressed in agape is given because of the character of the person doing the loving, God, rather than because of the worthiness of the one being loved. So let's take a quick look at God's love. God is love. Love is the very being of God. Love, love is not just an aspect of God, it's the very essence of God's nature. When we try to grasp something of God's love, we must all surely hesitate a little because the love of God surpasses all knowledge. And yet the love of the Father for the Son is the mirror that Jesus holds up to us to express just how much he loves us. John 15 verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Let's think about that. As the Father has loved the Son and could not live without him, so Jesus loves us, you and I. His love is bound up with us. We are to Jesus more precious than we can ever know. As the Father has loved me, says Jesus, so I have loved you. What a love. It's a perfect love in that it gives all and holds nothing back as it reaches out to us in invitation. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, abide in my love. Abide in my love. It's an invitation and yet it's much more. For this love surely suggests the motive, the measure, and the means for us to accept that invitation, to surrender ourselves so as to abide in that love of God. What do I mean by that? If we reflect just for a moment on the love that Jesus is offering us, 
it points us to the cross. Jesus' love for us, expressed and utterly poured out on the cross, gives us not only our motive for surrendering ourselves to that love. Why would we not? This is someone who surrenders his life out of love for us. But it shows us also the measure of the surrender that's being asked of us. Jesus' love for us gives all, and it asks all, simply because he wishes to be able to fill us completely with his love, not just bits of us. Jesus' love for us gives us then the motive and the measure by which we should abide in that love. But it also gives us the only means for abiding in that love. Why? Because it is only faith in that love which will enable us to abide in that love. If the love of Jesus is divine love, as we know it is, and if it is of such an intention nature, as we know it is, then surely we can trust and depend on that love of Jesus for us to keep us close to him. In his life on earth, Jesus knew what it was to be the object of his father's love. He knew what it was to abide in that love of the Father for him. And from his life, Jesus gives us an example to follow because his life was one of seeking the Father's will in all things. The life of Jesus was lived in loving obedience to the Father. Jesus was clearly not afraid of losing anything by giving up his life to the Father because he knew that the Father loved him and that the Father had no interest apart from that of his beloved Son. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that just as he could say, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. So he must also immediately say, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. It's John 5, 19 to 20. So too, as we prayerfully reflect on the life of Jesus as the pattern and the promise of what our lives may be, we can come to learn the truth of how Jesus is saying, without me, you can do nothing. Our utter dependency on Christ Jesus. Without me, you can do nothing. John 5, verse 5. Is but the forerunner of that proud boast of St. Paul, who said, who really understood that, who said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If we could but believe that, that call, that invitation to abide in the love of the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit, which I'll mention in the second part of our talk, then we too could say, as St. Paul did, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The paradox in our relationship with the Lord is this, that the more we surrender, give up our independence, as it were, and we're all fiercely independent, the more we actually come to know true freedom. Not the freedom to be whoever we want, but the ability to freely become the person God is inviting each of us to be. 
Now, I know this can sound a little bit heavy, but it's only the first part of the talk. And to maybe open it up for you, I'd like to end this first part of the talk by reading to you by means of uh, Joe's technology now, a short poem called Revelation by a woman called Anne Lewin. And Joe will put it up on the screen now for us. Revelation. God's work of art, that's me. Then beauty must lie in the eye of the beholder. I feel more like one of those statues Michelangelo left half emerging from the marble block, full of potential, on the verge of life, but present still by circumstances and fear. Yet part of me is free, and you are still creating, bringing to life the promise that is there. Sometimes by hammer blows which jar my being. Sometimes by tender strokes, half felt, which waken me to life. Go on, Lord, love me into wholeness. Set me free to share with you in your creative joy, to laugh with you at your delight in me, your work of art. What I would like you to do now in uh, groups is to discuss this question. How does this poem, and you'll have access to the poem, how does this poem help us to understand more clearly our identity as God's beloved sons and daughters? You'll have the question too. How does this poem help us to understand more clearly our identity as God's beloved sons and daughters. And I'm going to suggest that Joe's in charge and um, no longer than maybe 10 minutes just to begin to open that up. Thank you everyone. <clears throat> I hope that the poem led to a helpful sharing of experiences and thoughts in your groups. I know you didn't have long, but it is the nature of these, um, these sessions that we try to keep within the hour. For me, the line in that poem, full of potential, on the verge of life, yet prisoned still by circumstances and fear, expresses well something of how many of us can feel in our relationship with the Lord. Fear, and sometimes particular circumstances in our lives can hold us back when it comes to the deepening of our own personal relationship with God. But the truth is, it is only by entering into a personal relationship with Jesus that we begin to discover who we ourselves are, God's beloved sons and daughters, disciples of Christ. I believe this is very well illustrated in the story of St. Peter. When Andrew introduced his brother Simon to Jesus, we're told that Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas. That's the Aramaic. Cephas in Greek is Petros, which when tr translated into English, is, as you know, Peter. The meaning of that new name is rock. Reading through the gospel accounts, we get the impression, though, that Peter was anything but a rock. He was very aware of his own sinfulness. He was impetuous, often speaking out of turn. Finally, as we know, he denied in a moment of weakness even knowing Jesus, after earlier boasting that he would die for him. However, when Jesus looks at Simon, he sees not so much who Simon is at that time, but who he can become as a disciple. 
it's the same with us. So Jesus gives Simon that new name, Peter, the rock, and sets about working on him and with him to shape him into his new identity. And as we know, Peter, in spite of his weaknesses, does indeed go on to become that rock-like leader of the apostles and of the early church. God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us so that we might have everlasting life, life with him. God's love for us is not then based on our performance. Christ Jesus loves us so much that even while we were yet sinners, he died for us. God's love then is unconditional and undeserved. He loves us in spite of our disobedience, our weaknesses, our sin, and our selfishness. The parable of the prodigal son, as presented in Luke chapter 15, illustrates well God's unconditional love for his children. You remember the story, the father's younger son asked his father for his share of the estate, packed his belongings, left for a distant land where he spent all his money. A famine broke out, he began to starve, came to his senses, realized that even his father's hired hands had more than enough to eat. And so he decided to return home, beg his father's forgiveness and ask to be taken on as a hired laborer. While still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with love and ran to his son to embrace and welcome him home. Even as his son is trying to make his confession, the father interrupts to instruct the servants to kill the fatted laugh, fatted calf, restore his son to his place in his household, his identity as a beloved son with robe and ring and sandals and to prepare a celebration. This story that Jesus tells helps to reveal to us that God continues to love us in spite of our waywardness at times and waits for us to respond to his love and forgiveness. As the poet, I think, expressed it well, he waits for us to say, go on, Lord, love me into wholeness. Set me free to share with you in your creative joy, to laugh with you at your delight in me, your work of art. The love that God has for you and me is far beyond our human comprehension. As Jesus prayed about his disciples, this is from John 17, 21 to 23. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will come to believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. After his baptism in the River Jordan and as he was about to begin his public ministry on behalf of his father, Jesus experienced the Holy Spirit descending upon him. And we're told those warm words of encouragement from his heavenly father as to his true identity. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Mark 1, verse 11. When we were baptized, we too entered into that same relationship 
with the Father. God, as it were, now says of us, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter. And we receive the Holy Spirit to keep on reminding us of our true identity. In baptism, we receive this amazing potential. But God asks us to respond to what we're being offered, to activate, if you like, this potential. Not to leave it dormant, but to invite the Holy Spirit, first given to us in baptism, to help us to live out more fully our baptism and our true identity. And when, in response to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, we do begin to welcome Jesus into our lives as our Savior and Lord, then we not only enter into this new relationship with him, Christ Jesus, but also with his Father. Jesus shares with us this unique sonship. It's put beautifully in John 1 verses 12 and 13. But to all who received him, received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. It's this experience of responding to the Holy Spirit that is spoken of in the New Testament as being born again or born of the Spirit. We can be tempted to write it off as Protestant or charismatic or whatever. It's absolutely fundamental to our spiritual lives. It is the Holy Spirit who constitutes each of us now as sons and daughters of God. St. Paul puts it like this in Romans 8 verses 15 and 16. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. This is the amazing thing. And often it can lie dormant within us. When Jesus comes into our lives, he shares with us not only his relationship with his father, but all the rights and privileges that come from having that relationship. Our true identity is now found not primarily in our earthly relationships, precious though they are to us, but first and foremost in our access now to our Heavenly Father, our friendship with Jesus, and the constant indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, who brings it all together and makes it real for us. So I'm going to end my talk by highlighting briefly some of the riches that Jesus has shared with us in baptism many of which at times I think we don't really appreciate. The first is all the spiritual resources that belong to him. Can you believe it? John 16, verse 15. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. He shares with us his friendship. John 15, verse 15. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. He shares with us his love. John 15, verse 9. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. He shares with us his joy. John 15 verse 11. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. He shares with us his glory. John 17, verse 22. The glory that you have given me, speaking to his father, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. He shares with us his risen life. St. Paul to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. So if you have been raised with Christ, as we have, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. He shares with us his inheritance. Romans 8, verse 17. If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we also may be glorified with him. And finally, as if all that wasn't enough, he shares with us his future reign. From the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. All of this Jesus shares with us. How then can we continue thinking like the ugly duckling in the story with which we began this talk that we are of little worth when in reality we are each God's greatest work of art, made in his image and likeness, elegant and eternal creatures of infinite value. In fact, beloved sons and daughters of God. Just think of it. God loves you and I with the same love he has for his only begotten son. We need have no fear then, but only be in awe of someone who loves us so perfectly. We need never be reluctant to trust God with our entire lives. As disciples of Christ Jesus, our theme for this season of Lent, how truly blessed are we. Go on, Lord. Love me into wholeness. Set me free to share with you in your creative joy. To laugh with you at your delight in me, your work of art. Thank you for listening. Thank you for staying awake. I hope the talk has been of some help. As always, I've gone on a little longer than I thought. It might be good, I'm just wondering to Joe now, we could maybe just have five minutes uh, with the question and then use the last five minutes for any questions or comments. Absolutely. So uh, the next question for the groups of Bishop Patrick say would be have about five minutes uh, in the chat there. I'll send you into the room and then we'll come back for a final um, question that's for the Bishop and a final prayer. So if any final questions, please do um, add them into the chat. Um, I think we'll probably have time maybe for Bishop Patrick's quick answer, right? You might even have a chance for uh, two more. But if not, if any comments that you think might just be quite interesting to share, please do add them into the chat because I can circulate those comments afterwards. Oh, excellent. We don't often have the courage um, of our conviction that's a great point coming to the um chat there about having the courage to accept that i think that's very key and one of the gifts of the holy spirit that we can pray for and uh, to help us with that so thank you very much for adding that in there aiden and just give a final minute 
just anymore. on the, it, it is the Holy Spirit who does convict us, you know, of these truths. It's hard of ourselves, you know, to, to accept all this. But the good news is we don't have to do it by ourselves, but ask the Holy Spirit to help us to understand what God in Christ Jesus is offering us. Thank you very much, Bishop Patrick. Excellent. OK, um, just to conclude our evening, I want to say a big thank you firstly to Bishop Patrick for your time in preparing these two talks and, um, uh, and giving them for us. Uh, thank you once again to everyone for coming and inviting others to come. It's been great to have such high numbers uh, on both uh, evenings. And we do hope that you'll be able to join us after Easter, as um, I can confirm uh, today, i uh, got information. We've got two talks uh, again on Zoom on missionary discipleship this time. Uh, one on uh, the Ascension, given by uh, uh, Canon Chris Thomas, the priest of our diocese, who's the uh, general secretary to the Bishop Conference, and um, then by a, a Catholic missionary called uh, Pippa Baker, who will be talking on Pentecost and the Holy Spirit as we think about how we live out missionary discipleship and how these two great feasts of Ascension and Pentecost give us great gifts for that. Oh, I've seen some messages come in quickly. Just from, thank you, messages. Excellent. Um, fantastic. Uh, we've come to eight o'clock, so um, I'll just uh, lead us in a final uh, prayer and have it, uh, this great feast day of the Annunciation that way I think it would be only right if we pray the prayer that we hear on this day, the Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Bishop Patrick, may we have your blessing. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks to Joe for making it all possible. May Almighty God bless each and every one of you. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may we go in peace now, conscious of how much God loves us. Amen. Amen. Amen.